he, he would say, uh, give me a few minutes or something, you know, because, you know, even when, you, when the people, uh, baseball players, they need a little time to, to warm up, you know, you need to get, get warmed up. It's almost like I can't pray until I, I feel, you know, I, I, I hear the word of God coming in. It, something has to come in in order to go out. And so when, uh, when Tom said, well, Willie, why don't you come and pray for before we start this morning, I said, I don't know where to start. <laughs> but anyway, the Lord put this in my heart this morning. This is uh, Psalm 20. I don't know if any of you have ever, even if, even if you know it, you probably don't you know, remember it. You know, but uh, I'm going to read this little psalm. Then I'm going to pray what the Lord has put on my heart. But I remember, I never, I never forget this psalm because it says, "The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble." The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary, and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifices for life. Grant thee according to thy own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of the God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know that I, the Lord, save his anointing, and, he will, and we will hear him from his holy heaven. And with the saving strength of his right hand, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They that are brought down and fallen, but we are risen, and stand upright. Say, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. I can't give you the weight of that sermon. You have to know something about it, that in the day of trouble, the Lord will send you help from the sanctuary. That he will hear you. He will remember all your offerings. He will listen to you because he knows you. He's heard you before. Lord, send us help from the sanctuary this day. And, I, and just, this, just a few minutes when he asked me to pray, I don't have nothing to pray. You know, I, I, it's almost like when, when you read in the Spirit, I know not what to pray for as I ought to. But the Spirit knows <laughs> what you ought to pray for. I, I, you know, something came and said, uh, it's a verse that people, if, if, if the people of God, if the people of the Lord will, uh, how does it go now? That's right. Say it again. Yeah. And then I'll do it. If, if the people of God will pray, I will heal the land. He wants the people of God to intercede. He wants the people of God. He wants us to intercede for the man, for the people. And I, I, I just pray this morning for, for Tom and for all of us that sit and hear that we will remember, we will hear. And even some things that are spoken today will come to you four or five days later, down the road, next year. The word, the spirit that goes out, it has, it's not falling to the ground, you know. The Lord will bring those things back to us. So, Lord, hear us this day. We come before you this morning at the, I say, the conclusion of this conversation. And we want a special blessing this morning from Tom and uh, his heart. Because there's something about the messenger and the message. You can't separate. If it's a message from God, there's a, there's a unity there. There's something in it that, 
it comes more deeper than just the words. It's just deeper than the things that we say. But it's something that's coming out of us. So, Lord, we ask to bless Tom this morning. And uh, he, he might have thought, hey, you could have got somebody else, man. I got stuff to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> but God wants him to come forward. And uh, so, I, you know, I just thank you, Lord, for Tom and all that the things he's doing over there. He's a blessing. And we need him, and we look to him, and all the things he's doing. And all the saints just stretch forth their hands and say, bless the word, bless Tom, bless all of those who are coming this morning, and put a cap on top of this whole conversation, that it be, comes out in his words and in his life. And just we'll give you thanks, Lord, for all the saints and all the people you've given us in these days. And we say in Yeshua's name, amen. Can you hear me? All right. I'm going to do a Travis thing here and thank everybody that's been a part of the conference. Adam and Cheryl. Pat and Kim, and everybody that's been helping them in the kitchen. I again want to thank Ed, Ed McGinnis. Um, Ed's more, instrument, more instrumental in the whole God's foretold work than you might imagine. Ed, Ed invited Travis and me and Reggie down to Kansas City in 2013 to kind of just try to get the essentials. What's the essential part of our message? And I came away with it. I came away with the phrase, God's foretold work. And, uh, and we started doing the, the Saturday night meeting shortly after that. So I thank Ed for stepping out in 2013 and helping us again with this conference. But uh, when, you know, when I, I, was gonna, I was coming to this conference and I didn't think I was speak, speaking. I was going to just do my thing over here with the technology, and Adam asked me if, at some point, I don't know, a couple months ago, if I might have a message, and and I just believe in the Lord that I would have a message, so I said yes, and, and then he asked me about a month ago what the title of the message would be if I did it, and, and uh, this is the phrase that I got, Christ, yes, yes. John Sullivan, yes. Thank you, John. And I'm sorry he could, he had to get out early this morning, so he's he's not here. But thank you, John. And um, but anyway, this is the the phrase that the Lord gave me. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And I I I, I think you'll see in a in a few minutes here why why he gave me that why that was powerful to me and uh, so I'm going to spend just a few minutes just going through the same slot uh, not not all those slides but just this this timeline is always kind of in my mind and so when anything that I'm ministering it's there it's there in the background and um, so anyway I'm just gonna first do that little uh, the little thing, and I uh, apologize again, we don't have sound, but um, there's a nice little thing to it, but that this alignment, the two, the two days of Hosea and the seven days of creation, lining up in that the seventh day of rest, God rested from all his works on the seventh day. Lining up perfectly with the third day. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Um, and the after two days is, uh, I will, he said to them, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Until they acknowledge the one who redeemed them 
from the curse of the law. So good. Anyway, we're gonna. I'm just gonna let it play. This is just. This is just something that's always in the back of my mind here. And uh, if you. Seven, seven millennia. We are at the cusp. We're at the we're at the twilight, the eleventh hour of the sixth day. They have made me jealous. I will make you jealous. The Lord said to my Lord, "Sit at thy right hand until." I'm just letting the, I'm just letting this play, just for a couple of minutes, and then. And then I've got then I'm then we're gonna start. So let's see. Um, and then the timeline for me is is surrounded at all times by eternity. And the finished the finished work of Christ, which was before the foundation of the world. It's in God. It was as surely done before He said, "Let there be light." And then it says that. Remember, it says we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. So there's there's some mysteries here that have yet to be unpacked, but it says we have. Such a high priest as Melchizedek, who had no beginning of days and no ending of days, who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens right now. The veil is there kind of hiding his face from us in some ways. Um, Sometimes we don't feel like he is there seated on the throne. But he is there seated on the throne, a minister of the sanctuary. Five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. He made us sit together in heavenly places in one place, one place alone in Christ. Far above all principalities and powers, might and dominion. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in one place in Christ. And this, uh, so here, so. Let's we'll start off with Philippians. If you want to, I, I encourage you to open your Bibles because we're gonna we're gonna be in there a lot, and I want you want you to see it with your own eyeballs because I don't have slides for all the scriptures. So I'm starting out in in Philippians chapter two. So if you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And that isn't if. <clears throat> if you're not, you can be. <clears throat> but if you're seated in heavenly places in Christ and are being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, far above all principality and power, um, if Verse 1, chapter, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, 
Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I don't know where you are, but if you'll switch back to this slide, this slide right here. This is zooming in on this, the final seven, which we don't know exactly when that's going to begin, but we have our eyes looking for the, looking for the things. So again, these, this is just in the, the back, of, back of my mind, all these things that, that are coming. Let, the, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was seated in heavenly places, he, and being in the very form of God, though it thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I want to go over, I want to flip a few pages back to Galatians. Chapter 3. So I'm thinking, I'm I'm thinking of the last three and a half in particular, the time, times, and half a time, when he has accomplished to have scattered the power of the holy people. And our, our if we have, if, if we have, if we believe that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ, we need to stay in that place, not stray, not stray like the Galatians into a place of outside of believing. We have to stay in the stay in the place of believing. It says. This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law. We've been talking a lot about our approach to, to God. It's like we, and he, I think he said, uh, yeah, next, next. Uh, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. That was verse 2. By the hearing of faith. And whenever I see the word faith, Ephesians, I think it's chapter 2, you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Right? So whenever I hear, the, whenever I see the word faith now, it's like a little, little, little red flag comes up. It's like, this is not your faith. This is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the gift of the faith of the Son of God? 
Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? And I'm not saying, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, I I'm, don't uh, think I'm saying that we're trying to do that. I'm just saying this is going to be a temptation. And sometimes we just do it. I mean, sometimes we step out of faith and we start our own, in our own strength to do something. And God's faithful to smack us a little bit and get us back over here. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, by, be- by believing? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for right, and that believing was counted him to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, God's foretold work, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. And before we're done, I'm hoping that that means something more than it. Anyway, we're going to we're going to spend some time looking at the curse of the law. Because this is a big deal. (laughs) We. As many as are of, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If, you, if we start tinkering with it, anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. But that. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Romans, you don't have to turn there. Romans chapter 2, verse 13 through 16 says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. All right, and then one more verse. A verse that Brett shared on the first, uh, his first message was from 1 Peter chapter 1. It just jumped off the page to me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when I saw 
the revelation of Jesus Christ. My mind immediately went to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And I tell you, it's more shortly now than it was then. I'm, I'm seeing when it says hope to the end, I don't know where I am, where you can see me here, but I'm pointing to the slide. Hope to the end through that last three and a half. Okay, so what is the last three and a half? It is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of a people who are under the curse of the law. You are not. What did it, what did, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. But don't think that I, 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 I'm going to have a hard time getting this out. This is, a, this is all just things that are still, still formulating. The things which must shortly come to pass, the grace, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God is revealing himself in these things. He's revealing the Philippians chapter 2, Christ that humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So what I want to do, it's, it's, it's not going to be fun probably, but we're gonna. I want to read the curses of the law. It's not gonna. It's it. It's long chapters, but it's not that long. It's not three and a half years long. It's gonna be about. It's gonna be about twenty minutes maybe. So, I want you to hear. I'm, I might even say it after most verses. I'm gonna start off in Leviticus, chapter twenty six. Leviticus, and open your Bibles for this. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And he will redeem any, any of Jacob's seed that will find the grace to believe during this time. And anyway, all right, here we go. But if you will not listen to me, and carry out all of these commands. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and carry to fail out all my commands, all of them, and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. And, you know, we love the I wills of God in. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there's a lot of I wills in here. I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you. 
and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. If, after all this, you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of the land yield their fruit. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, oh, I'm reading a different version, sorry. If you walk contrary unto me, and I will not and will not hearken unto me, I will bring again seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, I'm thinking three and a half years here, also thinking of the prison camps in Nazi Germany. If you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you are gathered within your, together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you. And you will be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And if you will not hearken for all this, and if you will not hearken, for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in theory. And I, even I. Hosea chapter 5. I, even I, will go and return to my place. I will chastise you seven times for your sins. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. And I will destroy your high places and cut down your images. And cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries into desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation. And your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. 
Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate, and you be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, Upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts in the land of their enemies, and the sound of a shaking, shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee, as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursues, and they shall fall one upon another, as it were, before, the, before a sword, when none pursues. And you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. And you shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in, their, in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they, ex they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall, shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed that group by the curse. Christ has redeemed them from the curse of the law. But there are a lot of people, those that are left of you, those that are left of you, those that are left of you, Going over to Deuteronomy. Chapter 28. Thinking of Corey Tenboom and Betsy Tenboom. I think they were in was it Ravensbrook? And I remember, if you haven't seen that movie from 1977, it has aged well. But I'm remembering the scene where they get up at like four in the morning and go out, have to go outside and stand in the stand in the cold and. I don't even know what the purpose of it that was except to humiliate them and people, other ladies are passing out and then they come and beat those ladies because they passed out. Like, stand up. And Betsy says to Corey, Corey, we are in hell. We are in hell. 
Then she also said, not, not at that exact time, but she said, we must tell people what we have learned here. We must tell them that there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And they will believe us because we have been here. They will believe us because we have been here. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. It shall come to pass. Does anybody have a Kleenex? It shall come to pass. If you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments, his statutes, which I command you this day. Thank you. You see, God... has eternity in mind. I didn't have my flame that I have on some of my charts at the, in, at the end. Some will arise to everlasting life and some will arise to shame and everlasting contempt. This three and a half years is stop sign after stop sign after stop sign after stop sign. Don't push back, you seed of Jacob. Turn. Where you're headed is worse than this. It shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your store. Cursed shall be your, the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land. The increase of thy kind, your cattle, your flocks of your sheep. Cursed shall you be when you, when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall send upon you cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that you settle your hand to, unto for to do until you be destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings whereby you have forsaken me the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto you until he have consumed you from off the land where where you go to possess it the Lord shall smite you with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue you until you perish. And your heaven that is over your head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon you, until you be destroyed. 
The Lord shall cause you to be smitten before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And your carcass shall be meat to, unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth. And no man shall fray, fray them away. There will be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will smite you with the botch of Egypt, with the imrods, with the scab, with the itch, whereof you cannot, you cannot be healed. The Lord shall, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The Lord himself shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And you shall grope at noondays as the blind gropeth in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. And you shall only be oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save you. You rejected the, the one man that I sent to save you. You shall betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, and shall not dwell therein. You shall plant a vineyard, and shall not gather the grapes thereof. Christ humbled himself and became a man. And he entered into this. He came to this cursed place. If there be any consolation in Christ, let this mind be in you. Your ox, verse 31, shall be slain before your eyes, and you shall not eat thereof. Your ass shall be violently taken away from before your face, and shall not be restored to you. What was that verse? Joyfully being plundered. Accept the plundering of your goods with joy. Being redeemed from the curse of the law does not mean that we aren't going to go through these things. It just means that we, that we have a firm hope. We have an anchor in the heavens. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people. This is one that jumped out at me when I was right before I, before I, Adam called me and asked me the title of this message. Just read this, and it was really hitting hitting me hard. Your sons and your daughters got five. shall be given to another people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in your hand. The fruit of thy, your land and all your labors shall be a nation, shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and you shall, only, you shall be only oppressed and crushed always. so that you shall be mad for the sight of your eyes which you shall see. The Lord shall smite you, smite you in the knees and in the legs, and with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Isaiah chapter 1. The Lord shall bring you 
and your king, which you have set over you, unto a nation which neither your fathers, which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there shall serve other gods, wood and stone. And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among the na- all nations, whether the Lord shall lead thee. What meaneth the heat of this anger? shall carry much seed, verse 38, out into the field, shall gather but little in. Much seed, little harvest. For the locusts shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but you shall not anoint yourself with oil, for your olive shall cast his fruit. You shall beget sons and daughters, but, they sh- but shall not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All your trees and fruit of, the land, of thy land shall the locusts consume. The stranger that is within you shall get up above thee very high, and you shall come down very low. He shall shall lend to thee, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you, and shall pursue you, and overtake you, until you until you be destroyed. Until time, times, and half a time, and until the power of my holy people is broken. You can switch to that slide for a second. Because you hearken not to the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. Because you crucified the one that came to save you. And they shall be a sign for they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon your seed forever, because you served not the Lord your God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore you sh- shall you serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against you in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far and from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flies. A nation whose tongue you shall not understand. A nation of fierce countenance with a king of fierce countenance. Daniel A nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of your cattle and the fruit of your land until you be destroyed. Verse 52, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates 
until your high and fenced walls come down, wherein you trusted throughout all your land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord your God has given thee. Good Lord, it just goes on and on. Verse 53, you shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and daughters, which the Lord your God has given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith your enemy shall distress you, so that the man that is tender among you, there is none good, there is none righteous, no, not one. The man who is tender among you and very delicate, his eye, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom, toward the remnant of his children, which he shall, he shall leave, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he shall eat. Yet he shall not give to any of them because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith your enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, which you would not adventure to, which would want, which which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground, for delicateness and tenderness. Her eye shall be evil towards the husband of her bosom, and towards her son, towards her daughter, towards her young one that cometh out from beneath her feet, towards her children which she shall bear. She, can a woman forget her nursing child? She might forget, but I will not forget you. She shall eat them for want of all things, secretly in the siege and straightness. For with your enemies shall distress you in your gates. If you will not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in the book, that you may fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues fearful and the plagues of your seed, even the great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and, long, and of long continuance. Every sickness, every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, then the Lord will bring upon you and until you be destroyed. Very small remnant, Isaiah chapter 1. And you shall be left few in number. Whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because you would, you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to nothing. And shall be plucked up from off the land, whether you go to possess it. I'm not going to read the rest. Do 
Yeah, if you can take that microphone over there. This is one more brief passage, Tom, that just seems to me so appropriate. It just so compresses into a few verses everything you've just been over and the condition that we're still in and the great cost of, uh, of a blindness that has plagued the people throughout these generations and what it's cost God to set them forth as an object lesson, actually a revelation that should... Show the, show the body of Christ the great costs of their own escape and what it is not to escape. So there's a passage in Isaiah 42, and it says this at the first, 20, verse 21. And the reason I'm reading this verse first is because it punctuates all that follows. It's about five verses that follow. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. This is the famous servant of the servant Solomon. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Of course, he's the great fulfiller of the law. He's the great substitute. But here's the cost of not seeing that. And this really punctuates and underscores all that we've just read of the curses of the law. Verse 22. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivers. For a spoil, and none says, restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear before the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore, he has poured upon him, that is Jacob, the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. It has set him on fire round about, yet he knew not. And it burned him, yet he laid it not on. These passages that Tom just read have not yet been laid to heart. Thank God they will be. Jeremiah the prophet said, What you have so long not considered, be very sure that in the latter day you will consider it carefully. Let me stop. Take your liberty because I'm, I'm done. like a burning bush that keeps burning and no one no one sees it it's a it's an abiding witness you know of the cost of, of, of blindness and of the rarity and the grace and the gift of passing through that straight gate of of the regeneration where there's only by faith his righteousness. He's the one that makes the law. And it's the imputation of his righteousness, which is an it's an alien, it's 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 an outside, wrought outside in thirty three and a half years of perfect, perfect, spotless obedience under the exacting examination of the law, and that light is the only light that can come and appear before the Son of Man. And this is the thing. If we're not grounded in the righteousness of Christ and what that means and the liberation that it brings, if we're all caught up in our own sanctification or whatever it be, we're going to be on Christian treadmill. We'll never have a word of comfort and consolation for Israel in the day of his distress. You'll be preaching your own version of the law that he's under, till you're under it. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And the reason there's such a stintedness in our giving, a lack of freedom, 
is because we're not free. Because what we've received has not been received freely. It's been received with all the do's and don'ts that are our own Christian version of the law. So we're still relying on ourselves. We've not yet been driven off of that last vestiges of self-reliance. So you can drive out the law out the front door and, and, and magnify it, but when you're smuggling it in the back door, it only takes a little leaven. That smidgen, that scintilla, subverts and eviscerates, and it, it really sterilizes the power of the gospel. The gospel cannot bear mixture. It, it, it cannot bear it. And when you add anything to it, you divest it of its saving power. It can stand alone. Don't touch it. Like we said the other day, you know, that glorious passage in Acts 13, 38, 39. But, the le the, but legal flesh cannot leave that alone. And I loved what Adam said, you know, until we see the travail of his, of his soul, the servant's soul, and, and we have the same satisfaction, contentment, we're, we're propitiated. The, the wrath of infinite holiness has been assuaged. It's been quieted and calmed because it's received now. That one and only life, that one and only sacrifice by which the holiness of God, the justice of God, can be not momentarily till you mess up, but forever satisfied. And to, and to presume to add anything to that one satisfaction, like on the cross to tell us that it is finished. And, and you say, well, I'm a little nervous here. What, does it, what happens to obedience? What happens to all the, the, the imperatives of the Christian life? They come as fruit, like the, the dead rod of Aaron that buds. If you have that simplicity of faith in Christ alone and you're not mixing it, fruit cannot not come. Fruit cannot come. You can guarantee it will come. And it will look like him. It will be fruit after its own kind. Not the fruit of your well-intentioned Christian sincerity that just lays burdens on men's shoulders, grievous to them. We are no less than the Pharisees of old. We, when we add and tamper, with that alone by which the Father is satisfied, that alone by which infinite holiness is, is propitiated and wrath assuaged, that is the great crime of modern Christian, of, of historic church history. And that has been the battle. It is the battle. And to get all draw, drawn off into attractive issues that give us that inside track and we get moved from that great faith once and for all delivered that's been a battleground throughout the history of Christendom, I tell you, that is, that is a diversion, and it's costly. It can be eschatology. It can be some very important things. But when that balanced center is moved over, away from that one anchor and one rock and one center, and that is the revelation. When Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, he wasn't just talking about a proper confession, a proper recognition of a proper creed. He's talking about a revelation that flesh and blood cannot impart. That's the rock that can't be moved. It's knowing God by the spirit of revelation. Because in that revelation is a transforming vision by which if one sees it, he cannot not be changed. He cannot stay the same. It guarantees transformation. You cannot see Jesus, his face, his beauty, his glory, and have your affections drawn out to, after him and remain the same. You are forever changed. You may have a battle. There's a battle in the flesh. We bear about a body of this death. But that battle can never overwhelm and overtake you. There is a built-in resilience. You are now born of a faith. It's not just your own faith. Thank you, Tom, for that point. But it's a faith that's born of God. And that faith, if it's born of God, which is the issue of the test, can't be snuffed out or destroyed. It is a built-in resilience. And that's why Jesus could say, like Travis was bringing out yesterday, uh, last evening out of John 17, he can say, every one that the Father has given me, I should lose not one. John 6, 39. And that is the everlasting covenant. That is what, in just the same passage in John 6, 45, I'm quoting John 6, 39, that's the language of all the prophets of what will be Israel's in that final, period, uh, final millennial period. And here he is saying in John 6, 39, just like he said in John 17, those you have given me, they're not up for grabs. 
They're mine, and they're forever. It's my job to keep them. Like that wonderful um, analogy or, or, or a story from John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. You know, I'm not going to entrust this to you. It's too precious. You'll botch it. He puts Abraham in a deep sleep. So that, yes, this covenant's all about you, Abraham, but it's not, all, but it's, it's not up to you, Abraham. It's about you, but it's not up to you. You're going to be in a deep sleep. Why? Because if you're in this covenant, if you're participating in it, it's at risk. This covenant becomes at risk, you know. You let, you know, you let man in on something, and he's going to botch it. Uh, not sometimes, not maybe, but every time. And God's not going to lend out the everlasting covenant that he conceived in the eternal Godhead. He's not going to lend that and put that at the mercy of human cooperation. Be very clear. So I just didn't mean to say all that, but you know, it goes with what we're saying. There's only one righteousness that can pass the test. Only one righteousness that can stand. And baby, it ain't yours. Uh, when I first got saved, um, we had this special guest speaker come, Dr. Bruce Morgan, and all these kind of PhD learned things, uh, education and identity. And the pastor welcomed him, and what I want to say is that what he was preaching was free grace. Um, if you sin, it's okay because it's not you sinning sin in you. And uh, so you were free from the law so if you sin it wouldn't be accounted against you because you are in the spirit. You're, so allowing the, the flesh to do whatever it pleased and and I just didn't embrace that and um, the thing what I'm trying to say is that we've been set free from the law not to break the law, we're saved with the power of God to obey the law. It's the spirit in us that has the power to obey the law. So we're free to obey the law, not to disobey the law. Well, and that was... The obedience of faith is the issue and the product, it's the reflex, the response of the gift of God. But, the, but, that, but that obedience is in the gift. It's not like I'm going to give you a gift, now I'm looking to you to supplement and add to. Because I really believe this brother was, that brought that, if he be a brother, it's really a perversion of really a real truth. If you look at 1 John 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse, chapter 5, verse 18, 1 John 5, 4, if you look at the Gospel of John, if you look at many things, there is something in, provided it's a faith that's born of God, we're not talking about an easy come, easy go faith that springs up quickly and it's quickly gone. But we're talking about a persevering faith because as Tom said, it's not your faith, it's the faith of the Son of God. Not just a faith about the Son of God, or that it's the faith that belongs to Him. And this faith is born in us. I had a brother... Uh, here, uh, what well, was it, Doug? You know, it says it's almost like the Lord came in and uh, received himself because he says he wasn't even looking for the Lord, you know. And so uh, there is something in a believer that's a new creation person. And there is a built-in divine nature you, that Christ is in you. And if you're in union with him, there's something about the believer that's incapable of sin. That's really a true doctrine. And every Christian that has it, because he necessarily will, you can count on it, he will purify himself. But it's not a means unto, it's a result of. It's, it's the, in fact, there's something common to every false gospel that's out there. I learned this, it's so simple, it's almost comical. But every false gospel, it's not false because it's not accurate and full of a lot of good and right, reliable facts. It's a simple matter of getting the cart before the horse. 
It's a simple matter of, of failing to distinguish between fruit and root. And, and you, you know, if you can't get what I'm saying now, the more you look at it, I think you'll see it. That it's not that the facts are wrong, they're out of order. So anyone else? Yeah. Um, Tom, I want to thank you for reading what you just did because in a way it brings us into an appreciation of the reality of that scripture that talks about it being a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God and, and the awesomeness and the terribleness of God's judgment um, is, well, you brought it out by reading that. I, I, it reminds me of a couple of things I just wanted to say. So years ago, there was a couple, I believe they're Canadian, but Jay and Meridor Rawlings wrote a book called Fishers and Hunters. And it was a story of their travel to places where Jewish people had suffered. And one of the comments they made in that book was that, and they had various testimonies of people who had been called on to travel to different places, most notably places of Jewish suffering, essentially places of judgment. And one of the people wrote something along the lines that it pleased the Lord to send them there to weep. And that really strikes me because even in terms of the death camps in Poland, and I've had the privilege to go to several of the death camps, and I remember on one occasion being with Arthur in Majdanek, which is one of the most unsanitized, you know, Auschwitz is more sanitized, Majdanek, it, they've still got, the, you can still smell the shoe leather and everything there. It's, it's, it's a different kind of a place, and we were there on a very gray day. But in walking around that, it was very much like coming to this appreciation of what you, it brought us face to face with the reality of his judgments. And you catch that in Jeremiah and the lamentation of it, this tasting, and it's, it's, it's almost unbearable. I mean, when we had a sense of that. But that's what's been. But what is to come is worse. And so just to have that taste of the awesomeness of his judgment and who he is. I thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Huh? Oh, okay. I'm just going to close up right here. And uh, while you were talking about that, I was I was reminded of uh, uh, and Jeremiah. Uh, he gets this word of hope, of restoration. And then all of a sudden, why is Ra Rachel's children weeping and not comforted? And then he goes into this. Uh, it seems like a, an answer of comfort seems to come. And then he says, why do I see every man's hands on his knees? And uh, he, he get, continues to get a vision of the that this thing ain't finished until it's finished. That this, this is just a part of the big drama of God. Uh, and that something else, the new covenant, was, the, the, was birthed in, well, I'm sure he had a, an understanding of it, but he, he, 
gave a, a pretty comprehensive take on the new covenant. After just he needed a hope, and God gave him a hope to being redeemed from the curse of the law. And I think it's right in there. It says it's not going to be like when I brought you out of Egypt, right? He says this is changing, guys. This, and he and he and he tells them the radical change. And I think down close to the bottom of that chapter, uh, he says, "In that day, you will consider this." Is that in my? I think I got my facts pretty pretty accurately there. I don't have my Bible in front of me. We're little crunched here because it says it right there in Jeremiah 30 yep and in 23 also both places in the latter days this is back to Moses and now we've been talking about in the latter days you will consider it mm -hmm. but in chapter 30 30 it says you'll consider it perfect you'll consider it perfectly and then it, the chapter 31 opens up when I went to me, cause them to rest and if, if you if, if all you look at is the final three and a half years of the, is the brutality of what's happening to Israel, you kind of miss uh, God is allowing the climax of the vengeance and anger of man and the principalities and powers trying to repeat what they shouldn't have done with Jesus. They should not have crucified him. But the madness of their hatred toward God and everything that God represents, they're venting in these last three and a half years. God's holy arm has been open for everybody to see. Men's, the door of, of salvation, there's droves of people coming to the faith. And yet, this wickedness, what's it say in one point? Uh, they're blaspheming God. They're, they're, they're doubling and tripling down even though they know it's God himself that is doing all this. Cursed is man who lives under such laws. Distorting. Because God, Jesus, fulfilled the law, put it into our hearts. It's in harmony now with the Father. It's in harmony through Jesus Christ. So I, I just... Uh, just had those thoughts. If you think, uh, like Reggie loves to say, and I, I agree with this 100%, they're home, but they're not home free. And it's like we have these precious warnings to cause us to seek the Lord earnestly and find our place of participation in what's, what's getting ready to happen. Make sure you hold that up. Yeah, good. Yeah, there's one verse... Someone can help me find it. I'm looking for it. It's somewhere around Isaiah 30, 31 in that area, 30. But it's, it's God says, I have waited to be gracious to you. Amen. You know, it says in Psalm 102, 13, the set time to favor Zion. Mm -hmm. So the Lord has waited. And why does he wait? It's a huge question. And, why, and what has it cost him to wait? And why must he wait? Mm -hmm. It's because there is an, a reckoning concerning his divine insistence. If we don't get it, he's not going to indulge us. We've got to come to an end of our own presumptions, our own power, yeah. our own hope of any righteousness in ourselves. Amen. This is all about not the question of righteousness. That's not in the debate. It's the question of the source. Mm -hmm. That is the debate. And it's God's debate. So he's waiting till Israel has despaired utterly of ever building a righteousness that can stand before God. Mm -hmm. When they're done with that, God's done with the curse. And Amen. God's done with the great enmity that exists. Then this generation will pass away. The generation that resists the Spirit and give way to that wonderful generation that will keep covenant forever. Mm. And that's you and me, too. Amen. This thing has a double working here. It's, mm -hmm. And if, if the body of Christ is not instructed through this alabaster box that's been given at such cost of this object lesson that we have in the precious Jewish people, mm -hmm. we, if that becomes wasted upon us, if God's investment in the Holocaust, yes, investment, if that instruction is lost on the church and wasted on the church, how great is that waste? Mm -hmm. I will say this. There's a... 
if, if your faith has its origins in this earth, you are extremely vulnerable to get caught up with the anti-Semitism that will be perpetrated in those days. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> if your faith has its origins in this earth, you will find yourself being a participant. And I tell you, Peter himself was our best example of somebody had an origin within himself of his desire to follow Jesus. And, and on the day of testing, he denied the Lord. And he said with all of his heart, don't think he didn't believe what he said. That's the ultimate deception. When you believe that you won't fall. When, it's, when the origin is not in God who raises the dead, but you're trusting in man. I know me. I will help them. You're, you're, in, you're, you're already flirting, if not deceived. And that's why God said, Jesus said, Peter, I know this is going to happen, but I've prayed for you that your faith would fail not. And that's the faith that Peter came to when Jesus restored him. Reggie, I think you have. Yeah, I texted something to Travis when I got here earlier. And I just want to read this and maybe just touch a little on it and invite you brothers to unpack it a bit if possible, if we have time. This is very brief. God is using Israel in these last days and in all days. I did a word one time in uh, Holland on the Jew in our midst. Mm -hmm. The Jew has always been a great test of the issue of the heart and how we perceive the very nature of righteousness. Mm -hmm. if, you receive, if you perceive that nat the nature of your own righteousness as a great gift of grace, it's going, to work, it's going to work in you a pity and a patience and a love with those who are outside of that, who don't mm -hmm. see it. Because what is the nature of a priest? It's someone who identifies with the ignorant, the blind, and the out of the way, because that's you. That's why we could see that high priestly prayer in Daniel 9, identifying himself utterly. He wasn't indulging the practices of his people, but he was identified with the same with Isaiah. Mm -hmm. You'll always see that because there's no difference. They all understood 1 Corinthians 4, 7, who makes you to differ? Mm -hmm. Or what do you have that you did not receive? Now then, if you received it, why do you glory as though you didn't receive it? Mm -hmm. See, this whole issue of how we even judge is an issue of how you understand righteousness. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have such an impatient exacting of one another. Well, why aren't you getting with the program, brother? Why don't you see? Why, do you, why aren't you weeping at what you see mm -hmm. instead of being so requiring of what another doesn't see? But here's the, here's the thing I said. God is using Israel, that is the Jew, but especially Zionism, mm -hmm. as his perfect trap to draw all who have set light by his word into that trap that he might expose the heart and punish the pride of presumption. The Jew is God's bait. Now, why is the Jew God's bait? Because when you look at the Jew and you go, why doesn't he see? Oh, he must be especially stubborn. You don't know what you're saying. You're already glorying. You're already thinking there's something in you that makes you to differ. You're not in a a priestly identification with the people. You're not in that prophetic travail that Jeremiah and the prophets were. They knew themselves to be the elect remnant. They knew themselves to be the election of grace. They knew they had the new heart. They knew they had the circumcised heart, but they were in complete solidarity of identity with the people who did not have that. And they knew the name of God and his glory and all the earth and the vindication of the everlasting covenant was bound up with that people coming through out of that blindness and into what they had. And only in that day when there would not be a remnant, but all would know him from the least, then the covenant would be fulfilled, and then he would take rest. When, when Jerusalem will be at rest and a praise in all the earth, he will be at rest. Mm -hmm. So he tells us to pray. But there's this thing about the Jew being God's bait. Mm -hmm. It's particularly, particularly the bait of the church mm -hmm. because the church that has its own righteousness is going to look at the Jew. It's going to look at and say, well, he's, you know, but to realize that even the nations... God's picking a fight with the nations over a people who in themselves are not righteous mm -hmm. and are not better than other nations mm -hmm. in that regard. And so it's like a bait to, to test you as to the, to the, have you believed God concerning a righteousness that's not your own, 
that can only be mediated and given through faith, because that's going to give you an idea. A, 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 you're going to know the Jewish people after the flesh. You're going to get have a human evaluation, mm -hmm. and a human evaluation is a fallen evaluation mm -hmm. that takes no account of the revelation, because the revelation of Jesus Christ is also the revelation of another kind of righteousness, mm -hmm. and that's the issue at the at the end of the age. So it's the issue with the Jew, what kind of righteousness. It's, but, and the, the issue with the nation is here is a vulnerable people, and we've got theologians, good men even, who say that doesn't ever become their land until they're obedient. Mm -hmm. See, God is testing hearts over his, his freedom to give, to give by grace things that are undeserved, unmerited, and his election being completely unguided and uninfluenced and uninformed by human obedience. Because he's the source of that obedience. And we're waiting for, so we're waiting for him to be gracious when he can afford to be gracious without indulging the lie. And what is the lie? That men have it in their power to, 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 to be holy. Yeah. Okay. There's a reason Isaiah 28 was written. It says, uh, we, we, are we getting really close to the 11 o'clock? Oh, I just want to just put this scripture on as a part of this conversation you scornful men that rule my people doesn't it say in Jerusalem what? Isaiah 28 <laughs> out of and this is the uh, the top of humanism they think they have found peace in the earth without God but they actually think this is God they think their humanistic agreement with this covenant of death and hell is God's plan to give them this land. They think they finally achieved through knowledge, education, humanism, uh, never again. It, uh, you've got to understand these origins are important. The origin of your faith. The origin of your righteousness. The origin of, are we seated with Christ in the heavenly places? We, we need to get there pretty quick. Thank God, he says, I will annul your covenant with death and hell. But it's at a cost. And we need to understand that cost. And that's where we have to intercede, pray, and, and travail. Oh, it's hard to, man, we, we just hit, we hit gold here. And it's, a, it's like we got to land a plane, man. Uh, just, just, just take this into your heart. May this uh, word resonate, and if need be, haunt you, haunt you to a good place. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying haunt you like you know the world would use it, but I, I mean, may it resonate in such a way that you're hearing this this foreign something that I have not really heard before in that way. The Spirit of the Lord pleading with me, don't take the bait of this world. We just got to have to leave it there. I, I, boy, I wish, it feels like we could have glory break out. Re it's got to be really quick because these guys got to okay. catch a plane. And you got to so, catch it too, brother. The, the, nat the nature of evil is like to get us to hate. And then when we respond to it, it's pushing our buttons. We become what we hate. And so, if, so um, we're not responding to Christ, but it, it, we're responding to something that's not perfect. So if you hate the Jew or whatever, you're responding to something that's not perfect, and that's what you're becoming. And if you're, and if you're responding to Christ, then you're becoming perfect. And that was all I was saying. Amen. So thank you, Father. Bless these men that make it to the plain in Minneapolis. And just, uh, Lord, we just seal these up, these days up in your precious name, Jesus. Bless all the speakers, all the, all the participants, all the hearers, everything that happened. Uh, and let your word not return void, but accomplish that for which it is sent. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.